Okay, let's start our last session. Okay, so can you hear me? Yep. Right, so what have we given you? I have given you the uh, appetizer and the main course. And so now we are going to top it all off with ice cream. Okay, so it is dessert. And uh, I guess I have until uh, two or sorry. Four, four, three, four story, yes, one hour. One hour or oh, more than enough. I think I'll only take 45 minutes. Okay. So, um, so this perhaps uh, the, the most exciting part, all right? Um, so just now in the second part here, we resolved one open problem by Kumar Lee and Al Gamal. And we saw that uh, exact common information for some source, in particular the DSBS, can be larger than Weiner's common information for the same source. Okay, so this resolves one conjecture. I think the red is brown. Okay. So now we are going to discuss two other conjectures that are now theorems, okay? Um, and you will see that there are a family of other conjectures that we will talk about and we have no resolution for them. Okay, so we have only talked about the Weiner's common information problem, which was concerned with the system, with the Markov chain X, Y, W, sorry, X, W, Y, all right? So there's this whole other, common information study, the study of common information that is due to Gatz, Kerner, Wicks, and Hausen. So what is this problem here? So you have uh, X and Y related, for example, by a DSDS with crossover probability P. And you would like to design two functions, F and G, to create two random bits. So these are only bits. G and uh, F, they are bits. And you hope that these two agree. All right, so you hope that these two agree, which means that you hope that the probability of f of x equals to g of y, we want to you want to assess this guy here. All right, you want to assess this guy, for example, the max over or f and g. You may also want to control the minimum of the same probability. All right, so that is uh, the problem of uh, Gux and Kerner and Witzenhausen. So let, let us try to make this uh, precise, okay? So here we have x, y, a pair, of, a pair of correlated sources, and we can define the two quantities, okay? Let's call this a one-sided epsilon gux kerner Witzenhausen common information. This was not actually how gux kerner defined it, but almost correct. It's almost the same, all right? So we are restricting ourselves. So you are looking at the maximum of this rate that is needed is roughly the rate, normalized rate, okay? Optimized over all possible functions, such that the disagreement, the disagreement probability is at most epsilon. And we take, and we consider fixed epsilon. Okay, and we take n to be as large as you want. Okay, so this is some notion of what is the minimum amount of rate, right? The minimum amount of rate that you need in order to, to, to somehow generate uh, random bits that agree asymptotically almost surely, okay? So these are two qu quantities that we care about. And these were characterized in this paper, okay? At, at least the techniques in this paper will allow us to characterize these two quantities. This is a paper from 1973, okay? By Gux, this is Peter Gux. And this is Janos Kona, okay? So these two guys characterize this and they showed that actually, all right? These two limits, as you take epsilon to become very small, they give you a single letter quantity that is given by the following, okay? So here, what we are doing is you are maximizing over all possible functions. These are actually, to make this precise, is non-constant functions, all right, of the entropy, all right? So it doesn't matter whether we write h of fx here or h of gy here is the same thing, right? Because uh, these two random variables agree almost surely, okay? So one more time, here, f of x equals to g of y almost surely. Okay. So this is actually not quite uh, how Gux and Kerner set it up, but uh, nevertheless, we will use this, all right? This is called Gux Kerner Witzenhausen's common information. And it's then a bridge uh, version of Gux and Kerner's system. And it was discussed in Chiza and Narayan in the context of secret key agreement that we will not talk about because I don't know much about it, all right? 
So there are many other oper interesting operational interpretations of this. And we started this in the context of coupling uh, about three years ago. Right? So we're not going to talk about this, but many other operational meanings of Gux kernel with thousand common information. The problem uh, with uh, the GKW common information is that most of the time it is zero. Most of the time, we cannot get a meaningful number, unlike Wynas common information. For example, if you talk about DSPS, all right, that is the source like this. The doubly symmetric binary source half, one minus P, and so on and so forth. The Gux kernel Witzenhausen. Uh, Gux kernel Witzenhausen common information. For this particular DSPS source, is equal to zero. Similarly, the Gux kernel Witzenhausen common information for a jointly Gaussian source is also equal to zero, okay? So it's too strong. It doesn't capture what we want to capture, all right? In fact, we cannot even extract one pair of identical bits. If X and Y is jointly Gaussian or if X and Y is DSPS. So we need something more refined, something more refined that can give us a proper number because this zero means nothing, all right? We cannot see what's happening. All right, so we want to understand what is the maximal possible correlated pair of bits that can be extracted from X and Y individually. That's the question they want to ask. So this question comes with a multitude of names and we'll define this question properly later on. But this has a bunch of names in the literature. It's known as the binary decision problem in Witzenhausen's paper, okay? It's known as the non-interactive correlation dist distillation problem in Mosel's paper. It is known as the non-interactive binary simulation problem in Kamath and Anantaram's paper. And I'm not sure how many other names there are, there are, but basically we are going to look at this problem and some of the related conjectures. So this is the non-interactive correlation distillation problem. And we will restrict ourselves in this part of the tutorial to only the DSPS. Everything else is too difficult for us. Okay, so the DSBS is parameterized as follows. Rho here is the correlation coefficient. Square root uh, sigma x squared, sigma y squared. Okay, so rho here is exactly the correlation coefficient. The crossover probability is one minus rho over two. Okay, and we parameterize everything in terms of rho. Okay, so this is the convenient for us. So correlation, this should be correlation coefficient. Typo, okay? And XY is generated according to this. So if you're interested in other sources like Gaussian or finite alphabet or any other thing, you can refer to the references here, okay? So the non-interactive correlation problem involves the following, okay? So we have basically got this system here. This is a DSBS. And we, are want, we want to extract bits that look like this. We want to extract bits F, X, and G, Y. These are, as I mentioned, bits, so they are in zero, one. And we want them, we want these to have certain distributions. We want these to have certain distributions. So the probability of f of x being equal to one, we want it to be equal to a. Okay, g of y, we want it to be equal to b. And we are after, we want to have, we want to control the probability that they agree and they agree with one, or the probability that they just agree under these constraints. Okay, this is the thing that we want to study. This is exactly the thing we want to study. Okay, more formally, this looks very ugly, but this is the object we want to study. Okay, the agreement probability subject to the constraint that the probability that f the first bit is equal to one is equal to a, the probability that the second bit is equal to one is equal to b. Okay, so it's exactly the problem that I told you just now. Here, we want this to be Bernoulli a, we want this to be Bernoulli B, and we are looking at the joint. So we control the marginals, but we are looking at the joint. The joint is this guy here or this guy here, okay? So this looks a bit ugly, but this is basically, we are going to control the joint, but we have constraints on the marginals. Now, this is the problem we want to study, but this problem is difficult. We want to reduce this to a, problem in which we have geometry, in which we can talk about geometrical structures in Hamming space, okay? Now, if you look at functions, you're optimizing your functions, this is a very difficult thing 
but equivalently, we can optimize over codes. Okay, what are codes? Codes, a code is basically just a subset of Hamming space, right? A is a code, it's a subset of Hamming space. So you notice that, let, let's, say, let's say we define A to be the set of all possible Xn such that F of Xn is equal to one. We call this a support of F, right? So for a binary function, a Boolean function, it is completely characterized by support. So equivalently, we can maximize over support, over subsets. So here, A, B are subsets of Hamming space that have the property that the marginals are correct, and we are interested in the following. So this is a different way of writing it, all right? This is just a different way of writing things. And we can define the reverse in the same way, all right? So here is max and in this direction. Here is min and in these directions, okay? So this is a, as you can see here, this is a generalization of Gax, Kernel, Wittenhausen's common information. Now, so this A and Bs in general can be any number in zero one. They can even be irrational. Okay, they can even be irrational. But we are most interested in the case where A and B are dyadic rationals. Why? Because if A and B are dyadic rationals, then life is beautiful. Because these inequalities here can be attained by equalities. Right, it's very easy to see. If it's not equality, we can basically make the set bigger. If this is a strict inequality and A is a dyadic rational, that means uh, the dyadic rational looks like this, uh, something over one, two, eight. Uh, so this is 70, one, one, two, eight. This, this is a dyadic rational because this guy is two to the seven, right? If this is, if this is not, if this is strict inequality, we can basically enlarge the set a little to make this an equality, exact equality, okay? So we are interested in a direct rational case. And in a direct rational case, life is simple, okay? We can also talk about uh, the case where n goes to infinity, in which case we denote by gamma upper bar infinity and gamma lower bar infinity as the limits of these guys here. As the limits of these guys, point-wise limits. Then you may wonder, right? The good student in the audience will wonder, every time we write limit, we have to ask ourselves, does the limit exist? I always ask myself, does the limit exist? Like this limit here. So it may not exist. So what we have to do, limp soup, limp, limp. But then we do limp soup, limp, limp, we have too many limp soup and limp ins to take care of. But here the limit does exist. Because if I increase the N, this, this monotonic, monotonically increasing, monotonically non-decreasing, that you have more and more freedom, right? So the limit does exist and these are well-defined. This is well-defined and this is well-defined, okay? So these are all well-defined. And in fact, if you characterize one, you characterize this, the other comes for free, free, okay? Because there's some duality between these two guys. Okay, so we are also interested in asymptotic regimes, okay? The first is the so-called central limit regime, okay? So here A and B, which are the bounds on the probability that f of x is equal to one, probability that g of y is equal to one, they are given by these quantities here that are non-vanishing. Non-vanishing, they don't vanish. Okay, in this case, we call this a central limit regime. And we call this the central limit exponents, if you wish. Okay, they are not vanishing. But in information theory or coding theory, we care about another regime which is called the large deviations regime. So in the large deviations regime, these two probabilities, these two probabilities decay exponentially fast, okay? With some exponents alpha beta greater than zero, okay? Alpha beta greater than zero. Okay, I think this cannot be greater than zero. It is in zero one, otherwise things don't work. So here for alpha beta and zero one, we can then define the exponents of the probabilities. Okay, we can define these proper, pro properties properly, the exponents. And in particular, these two, these exponents, and in fact, their limits, all right, the limits that will be replaced by infinity, this constitutes something known as the Ordenlich, Polyansky, and Shaiovitz conjecture that I'm going to talk about later, the characterization of these limits, okay? All right, but I'm going ahead of myself. 
So we are interested in basically this problem here, the, the so-called forward joint probability and the reverse joint probability that characterizes the joint here subject to marginal constraints, okay? The maximum and the minimum. So now we'll talk about achievability. What is the meaning of achievability? Achievability means let us construct some subsets AB, all right? That does the job, that somehow does the job. So these ABs are subset of Hamming space. So they can be represented by certain geometrical objects. So here I draw n equals to three, okay? If n equals to three, then these have three components, right? Zero, 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 all the way up to one, one, one. All right, we call this a Hamming subcube. A Hamming subcube, a Hamming subcube is a basically a geometrical structure here, all right? With k components fixed. So here k is equal to one because the number one is always fixed. One is always fixed, as you can see here, always fixed, all right? So the, uh, there's a special case in which one is fixed here and the rest are allowed to vary, right? This is known as a dictator function. And the dictator, notion of the dictator function is super important in the so-called Kutat Kumar conjecture that I probably have no time to talk about. But it's uh, di discussed in detail in our monograph if you want to ask from me, okay? So this is, this is a special case we call dictator function. This, this is a particular, this is a dictator function. Okay, because only one is fixed. One is fixed, are, the rest are allowed to vary. So in general, if A and B are form this dialect rational for some K, for some K between um, one to N, all right? And uh, you take these sets to be subcubes, then you get these probabilities, exactly because you basically have K degrees of freedom, freedom here. And so you get the, uh, this is the, uh, you remember the DSBS has this probability one or one plus row over four, one minus row over four, one minus row over four, one plus row over four for the DSBS. So this comes here and this asymmetric R comes here. Okay, so that is the sub cube. You are fixing one component or fixing K components. All right, the question is, whether these geometrical objects are optimal in some sense. So there's another geometrical object known as the Hamming ball. All of us are very familiar with balls. So this is the subset such that the Hamming weight is a Hamming weight. It's not larger than R. Okay, so here you have the situation where you have a Hamming ball centered at zero and the R is equal to one because the weight of all these guys here is not more than one, right? This is a Hamming ball. So in the central limit regime, we can choose Hamming balls with these radii, okay? We can choose Hamming balls of this radii. And basically by the central limit theorem, we can get some control on P of X and A and P of Y and B. This is basically the cumulative distribution of a Gaussian. So phi of X is equal to up to X infinity of this Gaussian. Okay, this is Gaussian. Basically, we can estimate this by the central limit theorem if I take the radii to be of this form. Okay, and the joint, the joint can also be controlled by the multivariate central limit theorem. So this guy here is basically, you're basically introducing, inter integrating until lambda and mu of the bivariate Gaussian with correlation coefficient rho. Okay, so this is a method of calculation using the central limit theorem of these objects. So we can immediately get some achievability. So this is the forward probability when we take asymptotic regime, okay? And this is basically given by the central limit theorem where this is known as the bivariate norm, normal copula. So this is basically a control, the inverse of the control of probability of Fx equal to one. This is the control of probability of Gy equals to one. And this is the control of the probability that fx is equal to gy. This can be estimated using the central limit, bivariate central limit theorem, okay? So we're basically combining the bivariate central limit theorem with the univariate central limit theorems here, okay? So this is an achievability result. No one says that it's tight. Ah, but I want to, con I want to mention that, okay, this is also tight. 
this is just by direct substitution. This is not tight in general in Hamming space. Not tight in general in Hamming space, but this is by a result of Borel, 1985. This, this Borel is not the Borel sigma algebra Borel. There's two L's here, all right? The Borel 1985, this is tight for Gaussians. If the source XY is Gaussian, all right? This is tight due to Borel. Okay, so we can also extend uh, uh, basically the exponents case, but I will not talk too much about this. All right, just take minus log of everything. Now, another type of interesting geometric object is that of a Hamming sphere. What is a Hamming sphere? All right, a Hamming sphere is like a Hamming ball, except that we demand equality here. So here, R must be an integer. You can go from zero to N. Or it must be an integer. Otherwise, this is empty, right? So this is a Hamming ball here, centered at uh, 0, 0, 0. Center, this is the center. And R is exactly equal to 1. So you look at the weight. The weight of all these guys here is equal to 1, right? So the weight of all this is equal to 1. So you know, if you have studied chapter 11 of Cobra and Thomas, this is a type class. OK, type class is one of my favorite things. It's a type class with type lambda one, lambda and bar lambda. So this is lambda one minus lambda. This is a distribution in Hamming space. Okay. So in the large deviations regime, if we choose A to be a sphere and B to be a sphere with Rn equals to lambda n and Sn equals to mu n, actually I'm, I'm lying to you because we need to do this sort of thing. All right, n minus. We need to do this, otherwise it's not integer. The integer matters here. Okay, if we choose these geometrical objects, then we immediately get by Sarnoff's theorem. All right, this is chapter 11 of Cover and Thomas. That's why I say Cover and Thomas is all you need to understand my tutorial. All right, you get this convergence to the divergence. You get this convergence to the divergence. And you get this convergence to the divergence. This is a very, this third one is a very special divergence which we call the minimum relative entropy over couplings, all right? Because I, I hold the marginals fixed. The hold the marginals fixed to be given by px, py. So I have to keep this fixed here, all right? I keep this fixed to be px, this should be px, py, I think. Typo, all right? So I keep the marginals fixed px, py, and I'm able to optimize over all possible couplings that agree with the marginals. We call this the minimum relative entropy over all couplings. All these three give all these three statements are by Sarnoff's theorem. Ah, students here may or may not know this. All right. But Professor Hai Wan Chung and I studied this together. So she should know this. Anyway, this is the coupling set. So in the large deviations regime, we have an achievability statement just by using these spheres, type classes, right? So, Ordenlich et al, all right, so this Ordenlich, Polyansky, and Shaivitz prove this achievability result, okay? So this achievability result, basically you just have the, the third component in Sarnoff's theorem. Here is the third component in Sarnoff's theorem, minimum relative entropy over all couplings, all right? Subject to the marginal constraints, subject to the large, to the error exponent constraints if you wish, okay? So Ordelic proved the achievability of this and that, okay, in the large deviations regime. And this can be attained by concentric having spheres or balls, all right? Just by using the balls that I've talked about, or spheres. Actually, balls and spheres are exactly the same thing in the large deviations regime. Because by large deviations, only the, the outside, the sphere part of the ball matters. This is the, the worst exponent dominates principle. Okay, all right, because they are only polynomially many types. So, Ordelic, Polyansky, and Shaivitz conjectured that these are equalities. You cannot do better, all right? So this is the OPS conjecture, that these two are equalities. Well, what did they prove? They proved this lower bound and this upper bound, and they proved the case, they proved this, they proved that these are equal as a row goes to zero, and row goes to one. In these two limiting cases, these are true. But every row in between, we don't know yet. All right? So there's the OPS conjecture. 
right? If you're interested, I will show you a screenshot of it. All right, so we can draw these, uh, we can draw these uh, things here. We can draw these, basically these uh, exponents here. And what do we see here? So uh, we fix a particular row, all right? That is not too big, not too small. It's not close to one. So this is, these are the upper bounds, all right? This is the forward exponent, forward exponents. Okay, because we have a bar up here, all right? Don't worry too much about this. Just look at this. And what do you notice? Just look at this guy here. What do you notice? If you look at it and you are not colorblind, you will see that, hey, it looks convex. It looks, con oh, sorry, it looks concave, I'm sorry. <laughs> it looks concave because it looks like, you know, like this, right? And this has implications for OPS conjecture, okay? So on the other hand, if you plot the reverse exponents for the central limit and the large deviation setting, okay, they look like this. So what do you notice? That this guy looks concave, looks, okay? This guy. So also, of course, it also has implications for OPS conjecture. Okay, so we're not going to uh, actually look at, we're not going to um, justify these conjectures at this point in time. Now we're going to do a numerical thing, all right? That justifies this table. Maybe I should put the pictures up first. So what I'm plotting here is the following, okay? So this is A, I'm only considering the case of AA. So the symmetric case where the probability of the marginal is equal to probability of G Y equals to one is exactly equal to A. So there's no B anymore. A is equal to B. And here I'm plotting over A. And here I'm plotting the achievability for the forward part. Okay. I'm plotting the achievability for balls and subcubes. Balls and spheres have the same performance, exactly the same by right? the method of types. Okay. So you see that, oh, if you look at the left-hand side, you see no difference, okay? Oh, balls, basically balls and subcubes perform the same. This is a problem with MATLAB because there are some slight differences. And so here I plot against A and here I plot the log difference. If you plot the difference, you also cannot see anything, all right? So here I plot the difference, the logarithm of the subcube, log of the subcube minus the log of the ball, all right? So what we notice here is the following, all right? So for large A, so for, for sorry, uh, for A being large here, by large I mean here, A large, what happens here? Subcubes are better. For A small, balls are better, okay? Because I'm taking this difference here. But is this justified in any way, okay? Or is this just numerical thing, all right? So everything I've talked about is summarized in this table. In the large deviation regime, A and B are very small. They are in this regime here, right? A and B are super small. Then it seems like balls are better, balls. So it may validate OPS conjecture because, oh, sorry. Uh, it, may it may validate Sorry, OPS conjecture here, okay, here. But in this other regime here, central limit regime, for fixed and large AB in this regime here, it seems that balls are worse and we may want to use subcubes, okay? Right, so in this regime, we don't really know. But in our monograph, we study another regime known as the moderate deviations regime, in which uh, balls are also better. So moderate and large have the same behavior. And it is only in the non-vanishing regime, the central limit regime, the real central limit regime, as we'll see this regime here, that sometimes subcubes are better, okay? And we'll validate this theoretically, okay? So this is basically, you cannot see anything from here. You have to see it from here, that what is better and what is worse, okay? The bigger, the better, by the way. Okay, so the natural questions on optimality are as follows. So now I take A and B to be large. By large, I mean they are not vanishing. Say A and B, A equals to B equals to one half or one quarter, right? Why do we do this? We only care about dialectic rationals. 
dyadic rationals. And which are the first two dyadic rationals? This is two to the power of one, and this is two, two, right? We only care about these two at this point in time, all right? This case here is solved by Witzenhausen, 1975. And I will prove this in full for you. I'll prove this in full. This case here is known as the Moselle mean one quarter stability problem, okay? It was posed as a conjecture here. Uh, this is uh, Eljana Moselle. And uh, he talked about Borel's result for the Gaussian case. In the Gaussian case, this probability is completely characterized, okay? As I mentioned to you, using parallel half spaces and just using the central limit theorem. Now, in Hamming space, however, he, his space is minus one, one, but our space is zero, one, uh, it's almost the same. So this is the open problem, all right? We fix the marginals to be one quarter each, and we're interested in the minimum and the maximum. But here he poses minimum, but he said similarly for max, we don't know. So today we are going to solve the Witzenhausen, we are going to fully describe the Witzenhausen problem, and we are going to, we are going to solve the max part of this problem. So this is a, a Moselle's one quarter mean stability problem. We solve the forward part completely, okay? So that's the agenda. And of course we will talk about the uh, OPS problem. All right. So the OPS problem is as follows. Okay, are Hamming balls optimal for exponentially small A and B? So here A is equal to two to the minus N alpha, all right? And B is two to the minus N beta. The alpha and beta are the same, all right? So it's this Olenik's Polanski service conjecture. So this was in this paper here, all right, that says that our interest is in the, let me read this to you. Our interest is in the greatest and the smallest exponential decay of this joint probability for all possible sets of a certain size, okay? They are size of, a, they are basically two to the n alpha, they have some ex exponent. And they're interested in the, in the error exponent or the exponent of this joint probability, okay? So the main conjecture is that these two objects here, these upper and lower exponents are attained by concentric or anti-concentric uh, Hamming balls. Okay. So, so they show partial progress. They show partial progress. What they show, they show for the case, rho goes to zero and rho goes towards one in this limiting cases. Right, but all the rows in between have not been handled. Okay. So now let's talk about the simplest possible resolution. And that is the, the, the case where A and B are equal to half. Remember that these are corresponding to the probability that the marginal is equal to one, B, the probability of the marginal here is equal to one, okay? And we are interested in the joint. This is equal to, this is equal to one, okay? So this is the Witzenhausen problem when, we, when A and B are set to half, okay? So the question is whether subcubes and dictators are optimal, okay? Subcubes, basically subcubes are basically the, the the sort of sets of one multiplied by zero, one, and minus one, all right? This is a dictator, all right? Because you, you lead with this, okay? So this was confirmed positively by Witzenhausen using maximal correlation. So what is maximal correlation? We basically make use of the properties of this object. This is the HGR maximal correlation, where you are supreme, we are doing a supremum over all finite variance functions of the correlation coefficient, Fx in GY, okay? So this is very beautiful because it has several nice properties. The first of which is tensorization. If you have X and Y ID across the eyes, then this single lateralizes. This requires a proof, okay? But it's not so difficult. So this also satisfies data processing. If you have a long Markov chain, U, X, Y, V, then you have this, okay? The, the maximum correlation between the N ones, the N points is less than equal to the maximum correlation between the center, okay? And furthermore, for binary case, binary XY, maximum correlation is equal to the absolute value of the correlation coefficient. So these are three important properties, okay? Now, then we can do some algebra to prove, to prove the optimality of dictators for this case of central limit and half-half. Very special case. Witzenhausen proved this inequality, and I will show you exact steps of how to show it, okay? So you fix the marginals to be A and B. Now we even allow A and B to be different, okay? But we'll specialize this to A and B equals a half later on. Okay, so we'll prove this and we'll see that this will be completely characterized by dictators, okay? So we'll set U to be indicator of X on A, V to be indicator of Y on B, 
and we have this Markov chain immediately. Okay, so this is basically the definition of correlation coefficient. Okay, and the next step is, well, U and V are binary, right? Because U and V are these guys here, they are binary. So we can go to the maximal correlation. Okay, aha. Uh -huh. Now you form a Markov chain here. Okay, so U and V are far out, are further outside. You bring in the X and Y. Ah, uh, we bring it, bring it in here. Data processing inequality. Now we tensorize. All right. So this block length n. We make it block length one. That's the property of maximal correlation. Finally, this is equal to rho. Okay. This is exactly equal to rho. So what happens here is, why is this equal to rho? This, this, these guys here are binary also. Right? This guy is here binary. So this reduces to rho of x1. And rho of xy is equal to rho. Okay? Because these x and y are themselves binary. These guys are not binary. That's why we need tensorization. Okay? So what happens here is that here, on this slide here, we can rearrange this equation here to get this. Exactly. Exactly. Okay? So the important consequence here is that if I set, if I set A and B to be equal to half, all right, then what do I get? All right, so what I get here is that I will have, this is what, one quarter plus rho of square root of one half to the power four. So this is one quarter plus rho one quarter, which is equal to one plus rho over four, right? And this guy here is one minus rho over four. So we get this. But this looks awfully, awfully, awfully close or familiar to us because this can be attained by dictators, as I told you just now. This can be attained by dictator functions, which give us exactly this upper bound and this lower bound. Okay? Because there's only one copy, there's one degree of freedom. N minus one sub cube is a dictator. Okay, n minus one. There's only one, one degree of freedom here. And that's why this is power one. And that is also power one. And so we get that for the half, half case, for every n bigger than one, we have this result. This is due to Witzenhausen. Okay. So this is due to Witzenhausen. I, I did the full proof. And this is attained by dictators or subcubes. Okay. Uh, dictator is equal to, is the same as n minus one sub cube, okay? Basically, this, this is true. Okay, so we now go to the much, much more difficult problem, which is the case where a and b equals to one quarter. Now, don't ask me what, don't, please don't ask me how to do a and b is a random number, right? For a and b, one quarter is already difficult enough. And you can conjecture that a and b equals to say two to the minus k. These are also attained by sub cubes. Uh, this is a conjecture, one of the conjectures in our own paper. Okay, but for A and B equals to one quarter, all right, this is the Moselle mean one quarter stability problem. Now, this was confirmed positively by us using Fourier analysis, okay? So any electrical engineering student would know what is Fourier transform, all right? Fourier transform of a, of a time, of a function in time, you can just convert it to frequency, right? But here we are dealing with Boolean things. So, so basically we need these sort of eigenfunctions right, rather than the e to the j two pi something, right? So this is the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform, Fourier coefficient, okay? And you can reconstruct, you can reconstruct the function itself via linear combinations of the Fourier coefficients. This is just going forward and backward, all right? But now the eigen functions are different. It's no longer the exponentials, all right? So this is very familiar to us. So you can talk also about the kth degree Fourier weight. The kth degree Fourier weight is some contribution to the value of the function, okay? Basically, we are only looking at y's, okay? They have weight k, okay? They have weight k. So this means the uh, uh, k once in y, all right? They're only k once. So this is the k or the contribution to this guy here. Just like, you know, in traditional signals and systems, we also have frequencies, right? Frequencies uh, basically contribute to a particular time signal. So you can break it down into these Fourier weights, k degree Fourier weight. 
And the fundamental frequency, right? Fundamental frequency, the DC component is the most important. If you want to reconstruct your song, all right? Someone sings a song, you want to reconstruct it, you first use the DC component. Then you use the second highest uh, lower frequency component and third frequency component and so on and so forth. So our analysis basically makes use of the first component, first frequency, and the second frequency. All right, so these are some properties of Fourier analysis, the Parseval's relation and energy conservation, things like that. But what we also were able to do is to combine Fourier analysis with some linear programming analysis to control the first order, first uh, degree Fourier weight. This is not very difficult. The ideas are already in Fu Yong and Fu uh, and Yong's paper in 20 years ago. Okay, so the idea here is we control W0 and W1. The fundamental frequency and the second highest frequency, we combine them to get a bound on W1, okay? Now, next thing is we basically plug this all into the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which you also know, all right? The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for expectation, all right? So basically to control this, it suffices to control the agreement and the agreement. And this is optimal for the case of symmetric. AA, symmetric case is optimal, okay? So I don't tell you all the details here, unlike Witzenhausen, but I only tell you the elements of the analysis we use. As you can see, it's not very difficult. If you put all the right things together, Fourier analysis, linear programming, and Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And we use the most important frequencies, okay? Once we use the two most important frequencies, voila, we get this result, which looks very complicated but it is not. So what is this phi function here? This phi function is this. If we evaluate phi at half, what do we get? We get one quarter from this relationship here. Okay? Uh, sorry, phi one quarter. Because we are interested in the case A equals to one quarter, then we get uh, one eight, right? So phi of one quarter is one eight. So let's use this here. All right, so this is one quarter because A is, oh, sorry, this is why I cannot do maths. 1 over 16 plus rho, 1 over 8 plus rho squared, 1 over 4 minus 1 over 16 minus 1 over 8. All right? So let's continue doing this. So this becomes 1 over 16 plus rho 1 over 8 plus rho squared 1 over 16. All right? So assuming my algebra is correct, this becomes one plus rho over four square. Isn't this beautiful? So what, what happens here? These are attained by n minus two sub cubes. Right, n minus two sub cubes. So that's the next slide here. The consequence is that if A and B equal to one quarter, the upper bound reduces to this, which I showed you through algebra. And so for forward probability, the forward joint probability, one quarter, one quarter, is given by this. And in the general case, if you use n minus k sub cube, you get the forward joint probability given by this. So if you specialize this to k equals to two, these are attained. So this completely resolves the forward part of Moselle's mean one quarter stability problem, okay, for our problem. However, the reverse part is still open. And so we invite uh, enterprising students to do this. And of course, for any N and up and down, all right, for any AB that is not AB, not, uh, we only resolve half, half and one quarter, one quarter. Everything else is open, okay? But we basically resolve I, tell, I told you the elements we use, Fourier analysis, linear programming, and the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to establish this upper bound here. And this upper bound is tight. N minus two sub cubes attain it. N minus two sub cubes, almost dictators attain this. Okay? So we have resolved some problems in the central limit regime where A and B are non-vanishing. Okay, so all that remains for us is what? Large deviations regime. So 
in the large deviations regime, A and B are vanishing at a rate E. Okay, maybe we use two. Uh, we use two to the minus n alpha, two to the minus n beta. All right. So my longtime co-author, all right, he established that for any n bigger than one, we have these uh, non-asymptotic exponents. And these guys here, okay, are basically attained by balls and subcubes, uh, balls and spheres. Okay, what is this L and this U business? This is the lower convex and upper concave envelopes of these functions. So if you have a function that is not convex, this, all right? So this is the lower convex envelope. You're trying to make it as convex as possible and it's lower. So there's a lower convex envelope. All right, and the upper concave envelope is the same thing, right? So basically what happens here is you use Hamming balls or spheres to get some achievability. You use, you use Hamming balls or spheres to get some achievability for any alpha and beta. All right, like Ordenlich, Polyansky, and Shaivitz, you use that. And basically, this, these operators here basically tell you you can do time sharing. You can do time sharing to convexify your region. All right, that's what we love to do as information theorists, right? So these are recorded by these are these are achieved by spheres and box, all right. And what this actually shows is that, in fact, all right, this shows that a weaker version of the OPS conjecture is true. If you're allowed to time share, if you're allowed to time share, then the exponents are tight, all right. If you're allowed to time share, the exponents are tight. That means if you can remove these operations here, OPS conjecture is true. Okay, if you can remove these operations here. But what, what do we see just now? From the picture, all right, the picture that we plotted tells us that, uh, okay, let me go back to the picture. Uh, let's see this picture here. Let's look at this picture here. This picture here is for the re reverse part. This thing looks convex. So as long as we can prove that it is convex, for any row, we'll be done with OPS conjecture, right? Because we can, we, because what is the uh, lower concave, lower convex envelope for a convex function, right? So just now I drew a, a non-convex function, right? This, right? And I told you that the, the lower convex envelope is this. You try to make it convex, all right? But what if you start off with a convex function? All right, why do you start with a convex function? Then the lower convex envelope is exactly itself, right? No, no need for time, no need for convexification. So if you, if you are able to show that these guys here themselves, this guy here, this function itself here, this guy here is convex. This guy here is concave. Then you are done. And time sharing is no longer necessary. Okay. And that's what uh, in a recent paper, okay, uh, my co-author did this and showed that uh, the reverse part is convex, the forward part is concave, and so OPS conjecture is unconditionally true. So these uh, operations are no longer necessary. This lower concave envelope, lower convex envelope, upper concave envelope are no longer necessary because th they themselves are convex and concave respectively. And so OPS conjecture is, uh, is uh, uncon unconditionally true. You do not need time sharing. And balls and spheres are indeed optimal in the large deviations regime. So when A and B are of the order two to the minus alpha. So basically what happens here is when A and B are the same and they are equal to half or one quarter, this is completely resolved. This is resolved in the forward part, not the reverse part, and everything else is not resolved. Okay, so everything else is not resolved. This is resolved by us in, 20, in 21. Reverse part was, is not done yet. But this large divisions regime, OPS conjecture, is, uh, is fully settled. And uh, balls and spheres are optimal. Here, usually subcubes are optimal. Okay, so this is the punchline for this uh, third part of the talk. And, uh, okay, just the, the limiting cases, as I mentioned, were previously proved. The special symmetric case was proof here. But the general case for alpha, beta, not the same and not limiting. 
you require this theorem here. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. As you can see here, I run out of slides and um, I'm actually done. Finish. So we talked okay. about this extension of Gux kernel bits and houses common information and a non interactive correlation distillation problem. If anyone wants uh, some notes, I'm happy to give, but I don't want to post it online. The book is almost done. Yeah. And I'm happy to take any questions, or if you are too shy, I can answer questions on over email as well. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, let's see whether there are any questions from the audience. Okay, you put it here. <laughs> I know that there may be too many things I talk about. <laughs> so your monograph also include all such uh, different definitions of uh, common information and also their own applications as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a discussion of all these conjectures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some resolutions. So for your third part, I just wonder what's so special about AB values with the form of two to the, one word two to the K basically. Uh, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, if the A and the B are dyadic rationals, that means they are powers, the, the denominators are powers of two. Where am I? The denominators are powers of two, like this. So like, uh, what is the power of two? 256. So any number here, say 83. This is a very nice number because the denominator is a power of two. So the so in fact, these guys here, if the A's are powers of if the A's are direct rationals, they can be replaced by equality. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it makes life very simple. And basic it basically, if, if you have this scenario here, all right, then everything becomes equality here. And we can actually use geometrical structures to, to, con to, to describe A and B. If, if, if this were not, if this is not like a very nice number two to the power of something, then there's no way of, of course, there's a limiting way, but there's no finite block length way of, of, of constructing such geometrical structures because these are only in Hamming space. So for, so we are only caring about A, B is equal to one quarter. All right. Other things we cannot do. I see. Yeah. So you, you believe that, this can be generalized for any 2 to the k? Yeah, can probably be generalized for 2 to minus k, anything. Yeah, Every, everything else, we don't know. With the similar kind of techniques, the three yeah, techniques yeah. you mentioned. Yes, yes. You need to check. Uh, one needs to check this, especially for the upper, for the forward case, the forward mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we basically make use of a lot of um, theory from large deviations that we learned before. Yeah. And some central limit things and some geometry. Mm -hmm. And related to the question from Sinyan Nam, uh, can you give him any intuition or uh, some good choice of Rennie parameter for certain applications? So for example, like infinity, Rennie entropy is related to, of course, the detection or inference problem, since it look at the like maximum likelihood at ratio kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So can you give him any like intuitive explanation of how to use the Rennie entropy the proper with the proper parameter for certain applications? Okay. So the answer to this question is really very difficult. We do not know what is the right parameter for a particular setting. So the only parameter that we know that is of significance and has operational meaning or interpretation is the infinity case. Then we can interpret it as a variable length problem, variable length. And I think everyone accepts that variable length is important because everyone studies Huffman code. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes. So Huffman coding is somehow related to D infinity in some sense mm -hmm. in the second part of the tutorial. Okay, great. Uh, so I believe everyone could learn very broad, but at the same time, deep concept of common information from your talk. And some of the students will be uh, interested in actually reading your monograph. So 
yeah, if any students are interested, please send email to Vincent personally. And yeah, you can send email to this. Uh, I'm happy to give you a current copy, but uh, it's uh, still still maybe 80% done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So will it be published that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, okay. Great. Uh, thank you all for uh, staying here until 4.30. And thank you very much, Vincent, for your wonderful talk. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.